So welcome, Jeff, to this, well, first interviewed episode. Uh, although I did my own interview, someone interviewed me <laughs> for the podcast. This is the first official uh, episode where we're interviewing someone. And it's great to have you on board. Um, you and uh, yeah, I just, I felt what you're uh, coming, basically coming on your, your one day or your morning sort of network training event. Um, well, was it beginning of the year? It, it was pre-COVID, let's put it that way. Yeah, it's pre-COVID. It's got to be before, it's before February anyway. <laughs> but it was, but it was a great, um, it's great to see someone, you know, taking the reins and actually um, pushing that, uh, you know, the, the, the building control and standards uh, of the industry forward um, to get it out there a bit more because people need to, I think the industry, in my opinion, just needs a massive kick at the bottom. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it's nice to have you on and, um, talk about all this, this this side of things. So, you know, what what is it you you kind of want to cover today? Where, where, where do you want to go with this? Well, first of all, thank you for for me being your first. I mean, obviously, that's uh, <laughs> it's a great honour uh, to, uh, to to be the number one uh, that you've had on board. I mean, you, you asked me basically to, to come along and, and speak about standards. Now, standards can, yeah. can can talk about a whole whole load of things, and I think particularly in the um, the construction industry standards standards to a degree have got to the point of uh, we've got an awful reputation i mean in many ways the construction and property sectors are some of the least trusted of of, of everybody out there um, you only have to follow what's going on in the news at the moment with the whole grenfell inquiry yeah. um, some of the stuff that we we've, we've heard over recent weeks has, has been i think for anyone outside of the industry has been quite shocking you know that if you can kind of get me the contract, I'll take you out for a dinner kind of stuff that we've heard. It, it's all of that kind of stuff. And also the lack of appreciation of safety generally. So I think we'll, we'll probably focus primarily on that. Um, and also what I want to do is to, to perhaps just throw a couple of chunks of value in um, yeah. as well for, for the guys out there that are, that are listening into this. Um, just to explain perhaps where some of the regs are actually going and some of the things that they need to be factoring in, particularly if they're in, in the moment. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, yeah. Lots of people are getting involved in the property market. There are deals to be had, um, deals to be set up. And we want to make sure that people are aware of some of the things that are on the horizon that may just make those deals slightly less attractive than they yeah. might have been. So let's let's see what we can do to perhaps de-risk stuff and, and raise awareness generally. So yeah, I mean that's brilliant. That's brilliant because I mean for me, like the property, the property world. Um, you know, there's lots of these educations out there. And look, they are great, and some a lot of theory is great, but it's mm. very much based on strategy and very yeah. much based on. <laughs> You know, this is how you do a deal, yeah. but it's not. There's not the the nuts and bolts and yeah. like the nitty gritty, you know, mm -hmm. um, of understanding, you know, the regulations and some of the things. Because you could seriously, you know, you can seriously have a uh, dig a massive hole for yourself if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and I, I see a lot of people trying to jump into sort of developments and and have not even done a buy to let yet. And it's yeah, it's a bit it's a bit worrying really to be honest because you, when you go into a business. I mean, I've got a friend of mine who buys businesses and he buys and sells yeah. businesses. And this is the first thing we do, Dan, is we look at risk. We look yeah. at the risk of that business yeah. and then we work it out from there. Whereas property is taught, it's not, they don't even talk yeah. about risk. But yeah. it's, it's, it's the reward, the reward, the reward. Yeah. And it's like joint venture this, joint venture that, you know, yeah. borrow money there, borrow money there. But okay, well, what's the risk to that? Yeah. How can you mitigate your risk? And, and I think in particular, a lot of when they do talk about risk and that they do talk about um, things like that, it's very much focused just purely on the financial. Um, we're not actually talking about uh, some of the reputational risk as well that, that goes along with it. And, and what happened, I mean, if, if, for example, let, let's just give you an example. Let's say, for example, um, you're doing your first um, uh, HMO. So you've taken yeah. it, you've converted it, and you've gone down the line of, well, let's do it as cheaply as possible, okay? Let's, let's do everything that we can. So we, perhaps we've got some secondhand fire doors from another property or something, bung those in. We, we've saved a few quid there. Then subsequently, there is a fire in that property. Someone has died in that property. You are the responsible person. You are the person that made those decisions. You're the per person who has ultimately ended up with someone losing their life 
because you saved a couple of quid. Now, how does that play out? And I think if, if people start to look at all of the decisions that they make in the context of, if I was in a coroner's inquiry, how would this now look? Yeah. I think that starts to refocus people's minds a bit because we do see that. We see that on a regular basis. The number of times we'll, we'll be involved in development and it's like, well, we, what we want to do is we want to save a couple of quid here and we want to save a couple of quid there. And these are things that affect people's lives. It's life yeah. safety in a lot of, of cases. In other cases, it could be something as simple as, as, as insulation and stuff. But all of these things do have an, an, an overall effect. And if you're at that end of the market, um, you're probably working on a, a small margin in any case. And it, it probably isn't a wise thing to do. Because if you do find yourself the wrong side of something going wrong, you've got a particular problem. Also, um, and th this is something we can we can talk about in a moment, if, j just on the development side, just scaling some of the things up that people are prepared to start doing can mm. present a whole series of risks that they've not thought about. So perhaps we, we'll talk about in a moment things like um, adding additional stories. Perhaps we can talk about some of the uh, risks involved on standards issues around HMOs. Um, but even something as simple as putting a rear extension on, um, just being aware of some of the bits where the building rigs kick in on those. So perhaps we'll take a look yeah. at each of those in a, in a moment. I think I think this this is um, you know look, you know we're, we're we're talking about standards across the board, mm -hmm. and and I think you've already touched on why it is so important. And you know I've done I've done nearly fifty HMO conversions mm -hmm. uh, for clients and for myself over the last you know seventeen mm -hmm. years now. Well, mm -hmm. I mean effectively over the last ten years we started yeah. doing HMO conversions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've learned a lot and the standards have changed a lot and the, the obviously licensing has changed over those times, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm seeing, and I, I talk to people when I have conversations with people and they're doing HMOs and they say, well, building control didn't pick, pick it up, so we're not doing it. And you're like, but that's not the point. Yeah. You've got to be better than that. You've got to think more than that. Yeah. Like it's the, the one that gets me, and it'd be lovely to clear it up with yourself because yeah. you'll know you, mm. it's like fire line in ceilings. Yeah, a lot of people either overboard them, mm. Mm. which makes you know, especially in Victorian love and plaster, mm. you know, it's, it's stupid, mm. stupid, it, you know, it, or they it, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, as I mean, there, there are particular issue, issues in and around that, but I mean, that, that that's a good example of, uh, of a case. So potentially you could save a couple of quid because you, what you're doing is you're, you're complying with the minimum standard. So within the regs, it says about potentially you can upgrade an existing ceiling to get what's called typically a modified 30 minutes fire resistance. But why are you doing that? Yeah, if, if you've got a situation where this is a historical listed building and there's some period features and you want to keep those on board and you're, you're, you're tackling some of the other issues elsewhere, then, then I can understand that. But for the sake of you know, ripping down the bit of lath and blaster and sticking up some proper fire line fireboard. Why are you doing it? What What is the purpose of, of, of what you're doing? So a lot of these cost savings can have massive effects further on, on down the line. And also just, just why? Just why are you de going down there? Now, you, you were saying about building control haven't picked it up. Bear in mind that building control are not a clerk of work service. We're not sat there 24 hours a, a day overseeing what, what you're actually doing on site. So the best way I always think to explain what building control actually is, is it's basically like an MOT. It's on the day, you present something up, they check it, they do some, some typical checks, and they'll look to ensure that you've complied with the minimum safety standards. But that's not quality. There's nothing like quality. You, you don't, when, when you're uh, producing a new car, if you're a car manufacturer, you don't produce something to comply with the minimum standard of the MOT, but that's all building control is. So if, if that's where you're aiming, and then you're trying to sneak something through, through the back door, because they didn't spot it on the day, what, what, what kind of level is that? And, and, yeah. and that's some of the things that, it, if the construction and property industries are going to start tackling the, the reputation that they're getting for themselves, you, you've got to start at a higher level than that. Um, it's, it's just not good enough. It really just is not good enough at all. And I think a lot of it is, um, you know, when you look at, there's a lot of moving parts in, 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 mm. in property, mm. and, you know, refurbishments and, and new builds. Mm. And, mm. and there's a lot of people and it is generally a human uh, mm. you know it's a human to human mm. connection and, and yeah. talking to people and you know if you look at uh, HMOs I mean we, we're starting one um, at the moment in Gravesend for a mm. client 
um, you know, building control have already been engaged. Um, we've had the HMO officer around to sort of get their opinion on things because we want to, you know, we want to make sure that everything's being done properly, just in case they've, they've changed them, changed their tact on certain things. And you know, the amount of people I see it on um, forums all the time is another one. Um, you know, it's like kitchenettes. You know, putting kitchenettes and cooking facilities in and it, it frustrates the hell out of me that the HMO department within the council mm. are allowing it mm. because it's it's technically a planning uh, a planning yeah. uh, there's, there's, again, absolutely so there's nothing within building regs that stops you from doing that now th there's a whole separate yeah. question about building standards generally and what what the government set as standards and obviously with the I'm going to call it deregulation, but with all of the exemptions for planning, all the permitted development rights that are now being yeah. come, a lot of people are seeing this as a massive opportunity that they can get hold of a, a commercial property with that in a four or five residential units. Some of these are being built and they haven't got a window to them. I mean, what, what part of you thinks that um, sticking someone in a box with a small roof light is is really an acceptable sort of standard why why are we pitching it down to to that kind of level and that yeah. that's really quite worrying and some of the room sizes and stuff that we're seeing are, again a, a, a particular attraction but none of those are building rigs we, we can't stop that yeah and that's uh, where that's where the hmo team come in yeah and they should exactly. be yeah. picking it up for yeah. amenity standards and yeah. environmental standards and and they and uh, most of them are not i mean it's no. really it's really quite bad i mean if you you know because because i do a lot of virtual uh, support for people that are doing yeah. sort of like jumping into hmos now and they, you know from buy to or whatever and they just want a little bit of help with, with yeah. how to do it you know i'm doing stuff all over the country now and yeah. and, and and they're saying oh what a council the, the, the hmo person saying we can do that and i'm like well technically you shouldn't be but it's like it's ridiculous one of my favorite comments is just because you can doesn't mean you should and i, I think Absolutely. that really, really get gets the the thing around there yeah you it, it's kind of like having an affair or something just because you could get away with it doesn't mean that it's a bloody good idea to go ahead and do that um yeah. and actually having a bit of standards a bit of ethics a bit of something about you does make a world of difference in, in the world and if you can if if all of us start to take that kind of approach i think the world starts to become a better place rather than everyone trying to screw each other over for a couple of quid here and there all of a sudden we start to create a bit of a better society um and everybody actually benefits at the end of that because otherwise it just permeates down the entire line down the entire construction chain it's down to the subbies and and then well what can we do to to screw the subby over and we'll, we'll hold back on payment for as long as possible and i mean particularly on the larger contract you, your area you may not see this but certainly we see that some of the big contractors make a particular point of hanging back on the payment to the subcontractors and then that subcontractor holds back on the payment to someone else and, and yeah, then you get through it yeah. and, and, and then you end up with you know that they'll stop at a lay-by and pick up some someone from there to get the labor at the cheapest possible price because that and you just think yourself what what is going on in in this industry what happened to bringing your apprentices on bringing up people giving them training having pride in what it was that you actually did um I, i'm a bit of an old fart i'm in my 50s now i know i don't look it but but we the, the good, used to be, <laughs> <laughs> we, we used to have a different culture um and and that's definitely got worse i think probably over the over the past 20 years one thing i thought was particularly interesting about what you were saying was that um in your experience a lot of the the hmo officers are, are not picking up and, and effectively promoting standards now a lot of what is said at the moment is that the guys like us the, those of us in, in in private practice are the cause of the problem because these things have been privatized well actually the guy the bureaucratic guys or the guys in the, the municipalities and local authorities they've actually got they're creating as much of the problem as privatization is so it's yeah. not about whether you know private's bad public's good or anything of that kind it's about actually having competency and standards you can have good guys in local authorities you can have good guys in private practice it's nothing to do with whether it's private or public it's about whether you actually have that drive and belief in in, in making things better than they better than they currently are so yeah i mean a hundred percent, mate. I mean, you know, like 
we should be calling this reward risk reward responsibility <laughs> and regulations yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it, it just a lot of people just don't you know i mean I, I, there's a couple of little little building sites going on local to me and, and you know they're like four or five units and they're not they're not big things but i'm looking at it and i'm thinking geez you know like there's no health and safety in practice there there's no signs yeah. up you know i mean it, it, it's just even on refurbs you know like i like to make sure the boys have got high vis on hard you know, boots you know when they're doing construction you know ripping out then then you know put a, put a, put a bloody hat on because it's yeah. like you, you can only like look up and bash you yeah. and, you know and i see photos on photos on facebook with people yeah. saying oh look we're taking the stair 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 you know balustrades out and blah 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 if we ripped it all out well you should be putting something there for temporary support what if someone yeah. falls down and breaks their neck you know it's like Come I'll on. tell you what, that, that, is, that is one of the, the things that stuns me as an argument because a lot of the, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll blame a lot of the grand designs type things for, for this, but you see on the TV um, this grand staircase with no staircase guarding to it at all. Yeah. And, every, and if people then want that and it's like, oh, well, I saw it on TV. Yeah, but if you walk down that stair, the chances, particularly if you've had a few the night before um, and you're heading, up, you're heading back down, or you've got kids. The chances are there's a good chance you're going to fall off that. More an interesting one. More people die from falls from stairs than die in fires every year. Look at wow. all the stuff that we're doing on fire safety, and yet we're not looking at, at staircase safety in anything yeah. like the same way. So if, if you amazing. start looking at those things and actually, and, and exactly what you said about taking a risk assessed approach to things and start changing the, the way in which we do. Now, one of the things that um, potentially is going on with, with the fire safety bill generally, and this is something I've been kind of pushing for for a long time, is to get plans approved before you start on site. Now, I know that I mean, you guys actually tend to plan things through uh, in advance and do, do things quite properly. Yeah, we're very, you, we're very, we're very detailed. Like one of it, my, exactly. my, my system is preparation is key. It's like, exactly. like detail, details, much detail up front as we yeah. can possibly get. So you know, not only yeah. for like quoting and pricing, but also just for, for, for risk and understanding yeah. what's going on and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. But what, what you still see is, um, I don't know how familiar people are with the whole concept of the uh, building notice, for example, but basically for, for a small domestic extension, you can bung in a building notice, um, which is ultimately saying, we're going to make it up as we go along. We haven't got a pre-designed yeah. design. Um, we, we know what we're doing. We're going to put the foundations in. We know what a damp is. We'll just do it that way. But there's no actual attempt to design. Now, that's just asking for problems because yeah. you've not, the, the failure to plan in advance is basically going to cause you problems somewhere along the line. Now, a, a classic one for this that we, we speak regularly to people if you're doing an extension, this is, if this is a top tip, here's a bit of value for, for anyone listening in. Um, check whether or not there is a sewer running across your site. Okay, we, we've had people that have, have gone ahead and they've either started digging the foundations and then discovered there's a sewer, then you've got to go into the whole building over bit. Um, and in occasions, you won't be able, permitted to build over, so you've then got to divert a sewer. Diverting a sewer is not a cheap exercise mm -hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. So just taking some time out at the beginning of the pro project to just check whether or not there's a drain or a sewer running across the site and making sure you allow for that. That's going to potentially save you cost and drama in, in the longer yeah. term. So the more effort you put in earlier on, the more cost certainty you're going to get as you go through. And then you're not going to be getting towards the end of the job, which is often when the fire safety elements come in and you've suddenly run out of, of dodge. Yeah. Okay. You're not up against it when it comes to the time. You've allowed yourself enough time. You've allowed yourself enough money and you've spent some money up front to make sure you're in that solid position yeah. that's how you avoid the kind of dramas that you saw uh, that went on with, with grenfell tower and the kind of decision making that was then driven in because yeah. they they'd priced something up they've sub subsequently discovered that they've underpriced it and then all the way through they're trying to make it well where can we save a bit of cost here where can we save a bit of cost there if you'd have designed it properly in the first instance you wouldn't have been in that position you wouldn't have been making them decisions I mean, I, I remember from, from from coming to your to your breakfast network and, and training that um, 
I mean, it amazed me because I, I didn't. I, I mean, obviously, I knew about Grenfell, and I mean, it's bloody tragic. It's it's, it's terrible, and it's and but when you look at what wasn't in place, you know, like it, I, it absolutely. I mean, I've never worked on those high rises or anything. Like that. I've never done anything like it's not my my background. But you know, when you said that there's no, you know, there's no. Um, signs to say what level you're on and there's no sprinkler systems there's no emergency lighting you know, i mean it's like how have they have been allowed to build it that way i yeah. don't understand it's crazy what what again one of the issues with building regulations in this country as they currently stand is that it's based on a, a, a premise that you just sim you can comply with the regulations by not making it worse than it was now that is a shocking revelation to most people Jeez. but what one of the criteria is that if you've got a building as it stands at the moment that doesn't comply if you don't make it worse than it was you're still compliant so you can have a hundred year old building that doesn't comply in any way and you can understand why i'll give you the flip to it so if you've got a hundred year old cottage it's been like that for a hundred years it's not up to, to the current standards it doesn't seem appropriate to say, well, you're doing X, Y, or Z to it. You've now got to completely, you know, strip all the windows out. You've got to yeah. do all that. So it's not necessarily appropriate to do that. So you can understand why the regulations perhaps say yeah. that. But alongside that, whilst you're carrying those things out, aren't there some fire safety measures that you could put in? So if you've got the 100-year-old property, although you may not be required to put in a new fire alarm system, wouldn't it be a good idea whilst you're doing the electrics to put in a new fire alarm system? It's going to add maybe a couple of grand to, to the cost of the, the project, but isn't that a worthwhile investment to, to be putting in at, at that point in time? And yeah. that, that's where we're seeing something that's, that's coming in with the new legislation. I think it's, again, perhaps something to, to um, get people's heads around is, is something called a fire safety case and as low as reasonably practical. So what you're doing is you're, you're looking at the risk within this building. So it's a 100 year old, 200 year old, 300 year old property. It's got no fire doors in it. It's got no nothing to it in terms of fire safety. Although you could potentially get away under regs with doing little or nothing, what can you do from a practical point of view that's as, to reduce the risk down to as low as reasonably practical? Okay, so maybe you can't replace all the doors, but could you put in a fire alarm system? Could you put sprinklers in? Could you put? Uh, could you upgrade the doors? Could you do something to the, the to the ceilings? Now that may be a case. Using the example you gave earlier, where you've got this lovely ornate lava and plaster, and actually ripping it all out uh, with all the lovely plaster covings and detailing and stuff just isn't appropriate. But you could still do something to improve that standard rather than doing nothing. And I think that's yeah. that's perhaps the core message to get across. A, yeah, I mean, the the, the whole the ethos of this 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 podcast is about the practical side of it. So yeah. you know, the word practical for me because I've always been very practical. Yeah. I was learned yeah. from doing anyway. But yeah. you know, listening to what you're saying there, I mean, something I was talking to to one of my builders the other day. We talked about HMOs and like boarding ceilings and stuff, and he said that at one uh, I think it was a commercial unit. I can't remember now what he said, but he basically said that the building control asked him to put fireboard above the floor mm. so actually put it down on the floorboards mm. first and then mm -hmm. do then do your um mm. uh your, your, your boarding or yeah. whatever to put your flooring yeah. down and then just do just mm. get that height and raise it downstairs mm. so your steps are all the same etc mm. um and i thought oh, i've never heard of that i've never heard yeah. never, never I mean, heard the, 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 there are a variety of ways that potentially you can upgrade the the fire performance but particularly with that unless it's on the what we refer to as the risk side so yeah. the fire in order to protect the structure you need to have the protection between the two so it needs to be on the fire side of it so yeah. it's not it, it may give you some benefit but it's clearly not going to be as as much benefit to say putting a full ceiling below um, yeah. that, that would help to up, upgrade the two so always think about what side is the fire most likely to, to be on yeah. and try to make sure that you're protecting from the risk side to the yeah. escape side. Exactly. So you've got an escape route and you're doing it that way. Now, um, again, some of the things that um, some of the listeners today might be um, uh, considering is moving up to the next step. Um, so it's either yeah. a new development or in particular, we're seeing um, that what I'll refer to as airspace developments are really yeah. quite 
popular at the moment. Now, by that, I mean where you're adding a story or stories yeah. to an existing, particularly block of flats. So you've got an existing, say, three-story block, and you're now going to add another two stories, but possibly on top of that. Now, and, and this, I think, is particularly important for anyone listening today who's considering that kind of um, proposal, because the regs are just about to change. You literally have a matter of weeks before the new regs come in, um, which are going to start asking for sprinklers in blocks that are over 11 metres in height. Now, if you've got a block that's currently under 11 metres in height, and by extending it up, you're going to add extra storeys on top, you're going to take it over 18 metres, you're going to have to start to think about installing sprinklers in the existing block. So the entire block is sprinklered. Right. Okay. Now, that is going to have a major effect on a lot of people who are considering that type of development at the moment. Yeah. So it's really important that they're aware of that. Now, as things stand at the moment, if you're um, if you get your application in before November, you avoid that requirement. OK, what I would say is, OK, so maybe you can. And, and there's a lot of people out there that are pushing this. Get your application in before November. Okay. Maybe you can. But at least consider sprinkling the floors that you're in that, that are new so the new bit that you've got you can you can get to and install the pipe work in the common areas that would enable you to put sprinklers into the existing apartments when they become void if you get a void yeah it gives you the opportunity to whip in continue the sprinkler system into that particular apartment so there are things that you can do again to just think what can we even if we even if we avoid the regulations it stands at the moment what are the things that we can do as a responsible person because i think that's that's one of the terms you're going to hear a lot of this going forward responsible person about people mm. taking responsibility because what you see a lot in construction is but it was his problem oh i thought he'd do that i thought he'd do that well no oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's your responsibility culture. Yeah, it's yeah. the plain cult. The other, yeah. the other, the other thing, just to nip in there, mate, is is, is about um, you know people just uh, well, you say not taking responsibility, but it it drives it drives me mad. This it, this this whole blame culture mm. of you know oh well, it's not my job, but it's his yeah. job. And it's like, look, we're supposed to be working together to get this project yeah. done. No, it, starting from it, like special domestic side. Like, yeah. like extensions and stuff. The architects, mm. no disrespect. Look, there's, mm. there's, there's great architects mm. out there. Don't yeah. get me wrong, but 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 the majority of them, mm. they're just not interested. They're just like, give yeah. me a few hundred quid, thousand pound, two thousand mm. pound, and and I'll just you know whatever. They don't think about the practical side. They don't think yeah. about the three D side mm. of it, and they're looking at all this stuff. And then you get it, and you go, well, you know, where's the detail? Or they don't mm. tell them that these are just planning drawings, or these are just. Yeah. Detailed you know, these are not detailed drawings, it's just yeah. for planning. And then they go, the client goes, well, there's the bit to the builder. Yeah. Can you price that? And then they yeah. wonder why the price is never the right price because it's yeah. not detailed enough. It, and it drives exactly. me mad that you've, yeah, and it's, it's constant all the way yeah. through, right to the end of the project. And people I'll, I'll tell you, take responsibility. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on that because one of the things I find that's ultra frustrating is particularly for example, we, we all get, um, structure engineering details come through and we'll, we'll have looked at the structure engineering details and we think yeah they, they look perfectly reasonable and we, we've signed off you get to site and you go well hang on a second that just doesn't marry up with with what's actually there on site and you subsequently discover that no one in the design process actually went to site <laughs> during the course of that they were working from a desktop and it's like well how did you think that was ever going to work yeah if you've yeah. not been to the site and actually seen it how can you possibly think that you can design it so we then go well look that doesn't work so you have to go back and you have to get the thing you have to get all the calcs done again so that's delay it's additional cost it's additional yeah. problems and that could have been avoided by not going to the cheapest engineer in the first place who doesn't go out and instead going to one that does go out and actually does a, a proper job and has surveyed it and is aware of the fact oh, hang on a second, what I thought was a solid wall actually isn't a solid wall at all. Um, it's a timber stud and I can't, I can't stick my um, uh, beam into there on a, on a pad stone. Actually, I've got to put a post in there. Yeah. And, and it's, so the thing is, if you don't discover that until you've bought the beam and you're on site, oh, it's God, like, yeah. picking yeah. late. Yeah, so put, put uh, some effort oh. in, in in that first stage. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we do it a lot. I mean, we've got one with this literally just finishing up to start final stages, snagging and, and 
bits and pieces and um you know there's a box frame in the in the rig yeah. and i spoke to this other engineer i met on a mm. business network mm. he wasn't in my area yeah. and i just sort of asked him you know what mm. do you think about this mm. design and whatever and he said well it seems a bit overkill and i said mm. i spoke about i said look i suppose you can't really mm. you can't really understand it unless you yeah. come and see it yeah. um and he went oh no I, you know you give me the measurements and i'll design it for you and it's like yeah well no you've got to mm. come and see it like i know yeah. for myself yeah. All, over all the years, mm. any time at the beginning, mm. my early mm. stages, that I tried to do anything without mm. going and seeing it, it yeah. always there was always additional things or things yeah. that weren't quite what I thought they were because the plans I'm, didn't show I'm, it. I mean, how, how many times do you see on the homes under the hammer and all of these things where people have put a, a bid in without actually having ever been yeah. to the property and then are suddenly stunned when it's completely different to what they thought it was going to yeah. be? Or yeah. you just think yourself. What what planet were you on that you thought that that was going to happen? I think because the biggest... someone else somewhere along the line is probably yeah. against you and yeah. has had a look, so they've probably got a better idea than you. Yeah, look, auctions generally mm. not all the time, but a lot of the time yeah. they're in auction yeah. for a reason. You know, exactly because they want to get a quick sale and get rid of yeah. it because it's a problem or whatever. Yeah. But but I think one of the biggest problems for me in this industry is most of the procedures shall we say or process or whatever is is well it's down to common sense and yeah. unfortunately there's not much common sense around <laughs> you know it's, it's not as common as people think it is it, it, um, it, and, and then and then, well, and, then it, and then it just causes loads of problems yeah. well it, it, again Unfortunately, a lot of people come into the uh, into the property market either as accidental landlords, yeah, um, and they've got no idea of of property or whatever. Um, but all of a sudden, uh, are making a thousand pounds a month on 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 a rental, and it's like, oh, this is fantastic! I'm making loads of money. I'm going to go and get another one of these now on the back of that, and then they start thinking that they're going to build up a, a, a property portfolio without actually having looked into it or alternatively it's sold to them and i think we've all seen these events we've all seen the podcasts we've all seen the webinars we've all seen, yes you can you can double your money you can do that you can basically you're doing it with someone else's money and no if if something sounds too good there's a very good chance that it is not going to work out like that. There's a reason for that. So don't necessarily believe it and make sure that you do your research and make sure you, you plan. Um, I, I can't remember the, uh, the the full military thing, but there's a, a military thing where they say yeah. about all the P's, isn't there? Um, I don't uh, know if yeah. do that on the, on the podcast. Uh, poor, pre preparation and, no, poor preparation and planning. Uh, Ends up with piss poor performance or something along those lines. Yeah, something along those lines. <laughs> But the thing, the thing with all that, though, mate, is is that you know, um, you know, ninety five percent of the people that go through those things mm -hmm. don't ever do anything because then they, because yeah. when they get into it, they realise how bloody difficult it is. Yeah. Um, and and you know, even with mm -hmm. experience, like mm -hmm. some people get lucky and they get through yeah. and they, they they wing it and they mm -hmm. get through yeah. projects and they never have a problem and mm -hmm. and you know, look, but. I'm telling telling the listeners now it is not like that. It's not it's not to scare people. It's not to it's just as you said. Do your due diligence. There's a, there's a my, one of my favourite sayings from from uh, a mentor. I mean, unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. It's Jim Rowan, and he says, "Be forever a student, but not a follower." So listen to what people are saying, but make sure that the your it's your conclusion that you yeah. can't out the back end of it and it's your exactly. due diligence it's your research so you un you understand the picture you understand mm. what they're selling mm. and what mm. they're telling you and teaching yeah. you but make sure mm. that it's a product of your own conclusion yeah. yeah so that for me is very apparent within yeah. this industry yeah definitely and I, I think one of the uh, one of my favorite acid tests particularly when you're you're thinking about it in, in more detail and stuff yeah, whether it's the HMOs and the decisions you make. If, if, if you can use an acid test of, would I be happy if, to put my kids into that property or my mum or my dad into that property? Yeah, yeah. It, is this the standard that I would want for them? And if it's not, then you're probably not, not in the right place because if, if, if that's not how you would treat the, the people that matter most to you, that's probably not the way to carry yourself on in business. Yeah. And I think as professionals, 
um, I think it's for us to, to start stepping up and, and trying to keep getting that message across to people. Let's stop cutting court. Let's actually spend a few quid extra and get the prof proper professionals in, on board who are actually going to do a proper job and aware of it. Obviously, you, you do a fantastic job on, on, on the project. Here. I've seen quite a few of your um, projects up on the, on the socials, which, I mean, they, they do look at a, a standard above a lot of the, the dross that we see on a, on a daily basis. And I think that's where the real value add comes into it. And as I say, the, the, the real benefit is that you get to sleep at night having known that you've done everything that you can, you've done a good job, you've got some pride in it, rather yeah. than you've made a couple of extra quick quid. That, to me, is, is the message that you really want to be getting across. Um, yeah. And if we can get that across, whether it's in the podcast, whether you're coming along to one of our breakfast events or webinars or you're following that stuff on Facebook, Twitter, websites or whatever, if we can keep getting that message across, eventually it will start to sink in and perhaps we can genuinely change the the industry because i think that's the thing that we really need to be doing no i think you're absolutely right and in my next interview lined up is a guy, with a guy called uh, nick watchon who's mm. the founder of lmpg um, and he's very much about getting good standards and pricing for yeah. landlords yeah. um you know he gets a lot of the mm. stuff at contract mm. pricing um rather than all these rebates and all that stuff mm. he just gets yeah. the out up front mm. but what what's good about him is it's the same message is mm. like you know why are you buying a two pound light mm. switch when you should be paying three four quid mm. for something that's actually fit for purpose because if you buy that three four quid mm. plastic light switch yeah. you won't be paying 75 quid every couple of years to bloody replace it so yeah. you know just think about these things yeah. you know just stop buying two it, yeah. the, the one the one big bugbear that I see a lot mm. is people buying crap off Amazon and you know <laughs> taps and switches and oh, um, yeah. you know just stuff and it's like buy it from a proper retailer. Mm. Look, Amazon yeah. is fit for purpose for certain mm. things, mm. but not for products mm. that you're going to put in your HMOs or your buy to lets or even on your big commercial conversions or anything like. That. I see it so much and it mm. frustrates the life out of me. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you're spot on there again one of the things that we regularly see or we'll regularly have a discussion with um contractors or particularly uh where people are diying it um mm -hmm. light switches light fittings electrical fittings in bathrooms um <laughs> the the classic is the pendant lamp over the shower yeah, um, yeah. seen it so many times but it looks really good. I don't care that it looks really good. There's, an, it, there's a really high chance of you actually electrocuting yourself by doing this. Hey, Do hey, not. It's, it's, well, it's, it's a lot more dangerous than, than gas electric. It's yeah. like, <laughs> Jesus, it's like, come on. It, you know. it, it is. And as I say, unfortunately, you, one of the things is that we, we all sort of go to the boutique hotels and stuff and we've seen the bath in the in the bedroom to say yeah. it's one of these things you, you you either like or you really dislike yeah i'm not a fan that that concept but it's very much on trend at the moment and uh, don't even start me on the glass walls to the toilets uh with, <laughs> but that seems to be a, a, a trend but yeah. the thing is if you then stick a bath in your bedroom okay that is then a wet area so yeah. unless you unless you think about it, all of the all of the electric work that's Three around million. in that area needs to be it needs to be out of reach and it needs to be um, of, of like an IP forty four standard so that any water yeah. that sprayed across there doesn't end up blowing your electrics or worse still electrocuting you. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's it sometimes it's mind blowing, but um, it it's got to that aspirational point because people love the designer programs they love the boutique yeah. hotels and they, they think they can have that at home without thinking well actually there's a reason so that they've got i mean the, the tv in the bathroom uh, so you yeah. sat in the bathroom yeah. well that's behind an ip44 rated box it what you haven't done is just taking your tv and stuck it up on the on the wall yeah. of the bath Believe it or not, people think that they can start doing those kind of things because they've been along to a hotel and something. Oh yes, we can we can do that, and it's yeah, it does frustrate me. It does I think frustrate it, me. I think they I think these programs, um, you know, have a duty of care for that sort of thing as well. They should be they should be talking about um, that practical stuff. Yeah. That, you know, you, look, you know, this is this is a design feature, but it's yeah. done to a yeah. standard. It's got you know, they should be talking about that stuff as well because it, it, as you say. It, 
you know, the amount of people that do stuff and they just cut yeah, corners. Well, they're it, cutting corners and sometimes they don't yeah. even know they're cutting corners. They're just yeah. doing it because that's what they think it is. It doesn't make as good a TV though, does it? It's halfway through. Um, All of a sudden they've come across a problem. They've discovered this. Come back yeah. after the break. Yeah. No, I, I understand it's to make such interesting TV, but it does actually save lives. And you, you have a bit of responsibility from those people wouldn't, wouldn't go and miss yeah. either. So we've ranted a lot now <laughs> but we're of that there, age but but there's but there's a lot to rant about in my opinion you know like um but it but it is good that there's people like yourself there's mm. like people like say nick who are going to be interviewing because it's about getting the standards up it's about pushing that message out there so how can people start really looking at doing things properly like what's what's a good process what are you what are you telling people to do how are you teaching people to do it what's what's how, how does it work i mean our, our advice is always to, not surprisingly to get us on board earlier and particularly from the, the the building rigs perspective um one of the things that the, the fire safety bill is going to change as a for example is it's going to say that you need to start considering fire safety pre-planning um, but i would always say to people get come and have a word with us before you take the project on, okay? Before you've actually developed the plans. The earlier you can get that kind of quality advice on board, yeah. one, it de-risks you, and two, you know where you're going from day one. So you're not then having to adapt a plan to fit around that. And, and that's, where, that's where we really start to add value in, yeah. into, into the process because you're not undoing. So going back to my earlier example about the structure, you've not hit a problem halfway through the project you knew about that problem as early on in in the process as possible and if you can actually do that and we, we have done this with clients before we've actually gone in pre-purchase so for example on some of the blocks that i've said where they're uh, doing a, a two-story extension they've actually got us on board before they've completed the deal we've gone round with them quiet not dressed up no no obvious uh, logos or anything um gone in with them and actually gone well, hang on a second, this building actually would need two fire escapes or this building would need yeah, this. Yeah. You're extending the height of the building. So technically, instead of being a 60-minute uh, a fire rating on this building, it would be 90. How are you going to get into all of these other apartments to upgrade the fire safety in any of those? Have yeah. you thought about that? Well, no, I just thought there's, there's an extra 14 units that I can stick on top of this. And each one of those is going to go 150K a pop. So 14 lots of 150K and I'm buying this for 2 million. And it's like, well, have you not thought of, of, of yeah. how this kind of works out? So that's where you can kind of add value in. It's, it's to get, the, first of all, get the right people around you. If they're not talking the quality message and they're talking about, you know, cutting costs, do the then they're probably not the right people to have around you. Secondly, get that team in place early on. Ideally, keep the teams together. Make sure that you've got that quality group of people around you yeah. and that you're following on one for another rather than reinventing the wheel time after time after time. Yeah. Because that, that's where your value adds really start to come in and how all of a sudden paying more out to begin with actually saves you a hell of a lot of money in, in the long term and also most importantly as i keep saying allows you to sleep at night as well yeah and i think i think that's a great message mate yeah. and I, I think you know because one of the big things i wanted to touch on actually which is something you mentioned earlier was about a lot of these pd changes and a lot mm. of things with people doing a lot of commercial resi or retail yeah. resi, and a lot of them are doing it because they think well it's a great strategy yeah um, and it is a great strategy yeah. Um, but a lot of them have no idea what they're doing yeah. when it comes yeah. to what they have to do for this yeah. conversion. You know, like to get the fire and the sound. Yeah. You know, they haven't got a clue. Yeah. They haven't got a clue. Uh, you, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So, for example, uh, once you're into that, you're into SAP calculations, water use calculations. Potentially, you've got to consider disabled access. You've got the fire separation between the units, the means of escape. So, there's a whole series of these bits and pieces. It's not the same as, I mean, we, we recently had, well, I, I won't talk about the, the over, over detailed and specifics, but someone who'd traditionally been involved in doing uh, HMOs or loft conversions yeah. suddenly took on a new bilge timber frame. And right. they just didn't understand the increased requirements in around doing a new build timber frame and in particular the fire stopping details where one element hits another and cavity barriers and and everything that was involved in that and then if you were 
was, but it's just a loft conversion. It's not just a loft conversion. This is a new build timber frame block. Yeah. The rules are completely different on these. And you know, you really need to make sure that you you're aware of what you're you're taking on board and that you're not taking something on that, that's just too big that you don't have any experience of whatsoever. Um, one of the things that, that again that's quite interesting is um, literally in the, the past week or two. Um, the Welsh Government have published their response to the fire safety uh, oh. bill. Um, and in Wales, I don't know if you're aware, but in Wales already, they've, they've already mandated that all new housing has sprinklers. So they're already way oh, ahead of England. Right, yeah, okay. way ahead of England. Right. Um, but one of the things they're now saying is that the, the, the fire safety bill or building safety bill when it comes out um, is, go, is going to address not only buildings over 18 metres in height, which is what we're talking about, also, it's not going to just include buildings over 11 metres in height, which again is where we're now pitching the, the sprinkler level, um, but they're going to start to have a separate fire safety uh, system for all multiple housing units. Now, let, let me just explain what that means. That, that would include HMOs, obviously, but it would include um, a, uh, a property, a Victorian terrace, where you've got a flat on the ground floor and a flat on the first floor. So even if it doesn't have a common part to it, so you've not got a central staircase. So they've so, got their own entrances. You so even though they've got their own entrances, they've got a common floor between them. So there's yeah. the separation between. And that's one of the things that we see. So someone will do a refurb of their flat and they'll, as far as they're concerned, they're doing a paint and deck, but they'll actually have taken the ceiling down. Yeah. And they'll have stuck up um, a 9.5 mil plasterboard and they'll have painted it or, you know, our text over it. And then they'll have stuck speakers in, they'll have stuck in um, spotlights into it and um, any sound insulation that might have been has been taken out. That has reduced the fire separation between the ground floor flat and the first floor flat. They'll have taken up the carpets on the first floor and they'll have put down um, lino or, or whatever on top of that. So you end up with sound transmission problems. You end up with fire problems. So all of a sudden, things that aren't anywhere near where we're talking about, we're talking about the, this being a requirement of buildings over 18 metres in height to have it pre-approved. Potentially, they're talking about having the pre-approved plans for something as simple as a Victorian terrace with a flat on the ground and a flat on the first floor. Mm. Um, so you really do need to be aware of where the regulations are going and how they're, they're going about. If you're doing the job properly in the first instance, it shouldn't, shouldn't really be an issue for you. But I think everybody needs to be aware of the fact that these regulations are changing and they're changing at a fast, fast pace. Um, yeah. th literally within, within the, the, the past few days, there's been talk again of changing the requirements for uh, new housing accessibility. So at the moment, you basically um, said you need to have level entrance into the building and a, a, a WC on the ground floor that um, has a, an outward opening door. That's the minimum standard. Well, they're talking about the minimum standard now being moved up to the next level up. So you start to have to have a staircase that could have a um a stair lift fitted you've got to have a toilet that could be converted to a ground floor shower room for example right. so exactly. these things nice. these things are all on the agenda um and mm. that's why it's important to keep yourself up to date follow us um we're on all the socials check out our website get in touch in, in any name way shape me, or form. Me too. I'll go, i'm going to ask i'm going to yeah. ask if get in touch with you in a bit as well so but, but in do in make sure whether it's us or whoever make sure you stay up to date with these changes as otherwise you could really come a cropper um, one of my favorites and i will we're perhaps getting to the end of the um the 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 uh, webinar today um is, is to mention again that my favorite the classic one where the legislation's already in, in place um where we're going to start having a requirement as to what height your letterbox is going to be on your door um <laughs> now it, it it seems stunning but the rigs are there they're they're all, all ready yeah. to go. It's had its time in, in the house. And basically, you can no longer have a low-level letterbox so that the postie doesn't have to bend down um, to, to pop one in. So if you were yeah. thinking of having a fully glazed door with a, a letter um, box, yeah, at the, box, at the post box at the bottom, you're going to have to watch out for those things. Wow. Wow. That is, that is unbelievable. <laughs> but, it's, it, you know, these are all things that as i say you know they're all coming in and, and people need to be aware of, of all this sort of stuff um 
but it's it's it's, it's getting it, it it's also getting it policed as well it's like how you know how people are getting yeah. away with this stuff still yeah but you know just to just to sort of wrap up like what you know you've, you've had lots of um sort of basic examples but like what if someone doesn't do this like what's a recent example where something has cost them a lot of money or it's cost you know it's, it's gone down a very so, so, bad so cl route. classic example of, of that we had um the, the one that was mentioning the the new build um, um timber frame yeah. um basically we went down there they for whatever reason they'd stuck a tenant in before we'd signed it off um so we basically threatened to close them down they had to move the tenant out they had to strip back the um internal walls um, actually refit some of the plasterboard and the fire stop in and the cavity barriers. Um, so you ended up with probably about six weeks of stripping everything back, moving a tenant out, rehousing them to somewhere else, and then moving them back in. So, so there are definite consequences to, to not taking the time to do it. But more importantly, um, when the new fire safety rules come into place, um, you're going to start seeing that these are going to have fines. You're going to have stop notices. You're going to have a situation where people can be prosecuted. There will be jail sentences for getting this stuff wrong. So the, the whole thing is starting to change and there are teeth coming. But let's not get to that. We, we Hopefully, yeah, exactly. as an industry, we can... We can just address this now. So one, it's a really bad move financially. Two, it's a really bad move reputationally because that tenant is now going to go, well, I had to be moved out. They ain't got the fire safe. How, how trustworthy will you be of other things that are in that block if yeah. you've had to be moved out because you know yeah. that building control have basically condemned it? Um, and lastly, bear in mind the fact that you could find yourself not only fined, but potentially in jail for getting this wrong. And God help you if you're ever in front of an inquiry and people have actually died as a result of some of the decisions that you've been making. So make sure you're making the right decisions, make sure that you can sleep at night and always use that acid test. Would I be happy if my kids or my mum or my dad were in this building? And if you can, I think you're probably heading on the right road.